good to be here and good to see each one of you tonight and appreciate your prayers um, for me and for the services that the Lord would help us and bless us together. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Um, we always want to be an encouragement. Uh, always want to be an encouragement to the Lord's people. Uh, nevertheless, there are some very sobering things that we as the Lord's people need to know and understand. And, and that our Lord Jesus certainly is always an encouragement to us. Amen. Uh, he's rescued us from a, a low, low estate. Mm-hmm. But there are some things uh, that uh, that are at hand that we need to know about as his children. And, and for those that are not saved, they need to be warned. And so those things may not necessarily be encouraging, but certainly provoking. Amen. I trust that that will be the case tonight for all of us. Um, I think we will be encouraged, uh, but <laughs> most likely I trust more provoke. And I mean that in a good way, in a right way, in a way that we glorify our Lord. Mm-hmm. The book of Hebrews, it seems to be written uh, when there's debate about who wrote it, and uh, that's not really important. It's neat to try to delve into that, to try to understand it, but uh, we're not told who wrote the book. But certainly it's written to Jews, and I think it's written because of the Judaizing problem that was found there in Jerusalem and up to Antioch and in Galatia and such as that. The Lord laid it on the heart and gave the word, this word to a brother to deal with how Christ is the answer to all things uh, in the law in the Old Testament. Amen. Indeed he is. There's a lot in the book of Hebrews that we learn about the Lord Jesus that otherwise we wouldn't know. Um, and it, the book of Hebrews really takes that and wraps it up very well. As he's dealing here with uh, that which is that Christ fills, we come on these verses at the latter part of chapter 9, verse number 27, where, the, where our Lord uh, inspires the brother, the brother writes, And as it is appointed unto, man, want, unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, Amen. so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We, we as saved, we very much look forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our brother and sister saying, going home. We look forward to going home. This is not our home. We look forward to going home to be with our Lord. All the challenges, all the pain, all the wickedness that we see. When we go to be with the Lord, all that will be dealt with and gone. Amen. We will be impervious to it in regards to the millennial reign of our Lord. Mm-hmm. And uh, be like Christ. Amen. And we look forward to that. And what we should. And that is encouraging to know that our Lord Jesus is coming back for us. If you're here and you're not saved, you need the Lord Jesus as Savior because you don't have that hope. But in Him you can have that hope. Amen. Have forgiveness, be saved, be rescued, and have that hope. But without Him, you don't have any hope. But going to be with the Lord, there's something there that's really, really close to that. And this verse speaks of it in, in uh, verse number 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. To go on to be with the Lord means there's going to be a judgment. Amen. Amen. And um, we like to think about more about seeing the Lord mm. and being with Him and that, but we are saved and those that are not saved are all going to face a judgment. And that's what we want to take a look at tonight is this of the judgments. In Mark chapter, or Matthew chapter 25, this is one verse that folks take, and, and it's, uh, it's understandable that, that folks would do that. That's the reason we need to take the whole counsel of God and put it together what the truth is. But the, this passage right here, if this was the only passage that we would have, we would be led to think that there's just going to be one judge uh, and where there's going to be just uh, all gathered there and parsing out of, of uh, the, the 
people and the, the, uh, the mankind and all those that live. We take a look at verse number 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Now that strikes a picture in your mind, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, all nations. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And so he goes on and speaks about the, the sheep to the right hand, the goats to the left. And uh, he'll say to those on the right hand, these things come, you blessed of my father, verse 34, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he tells about the different things that uh, they did. And then they answer back. He said, well, when did we do that to you? And he said, well, when you did it, um, uh, you know, when do we see a stranger or took thee in or naked and clothed thee? The king shall answer, verse 40, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, uh, in so much as ye have done it to one of the least of these, my brother, you've done it unto me. And so that connection of the Lord and his own, his children, it's very, very close. And so it's good to be compassionate and good to be hospitable, uh, indeed. Uh, and then uh, um, he shall say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire. And remember that, that reference there, prepared for the devil and his angels. And he went down this whole list here. And, uh, uh, and, and that he did with the, the, those that they in the other group. In verse 45, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, and as much as you did it not to one of the least of thee, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And so, if we just had that verse, we think there's just one judgment, this parsing out, those on the right, those on the left, and there it is. So I think we get this, uh, we can see that this you know, this thought could come about also by brother what John, the, by, by what brother John the Baptist preached, uh, as recorded in Matthew three, verses eleven and twelve. He says, "I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, or the cause of repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I." He said, "There's somebody coming after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear or to carry. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That is salvation, eternal <laughs> judgment." Mm -hmm. whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor he'll gather the wheat into his, the garner he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire and exactly. so from that kernel you have the, the wheat, the grain, and then you have the chaff and so folks might look at these passages and think there's only one judgment but that's not the case Amen. the scripture bears out and tells yeah. us more about the judgments and there are two Amen. actually there's four but in regards to mankind, there are two. <laughs> there are two. One thing that I want to interject uh, right now, and, I, and, and this is for all of us, it's, it's so um, for, for any person, saved or not saved. There's the boldness of mankind. Brother Solomon speaks about this in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. We kind of think, we will with us, if something wrong is done, and time stretches on and lags, and we, we know our legal system has worked that way just to stretch the time. Politics works that way, just to stretch out the time. Mm -hmm. Justice, vengeance, what, whatever the case is that's at hand, it's just not. It's just not as good as it would be if it would be immediate, because uh, that just tells it. That that just takes care of the issue. You have someone that walks in and murders people, as we've seen recently. If they were dealt with by the judicial system and dealt with, there's witnesses, it's them, there's no doubt, and they would be executed, as the scripture says. Mm -hmm. Then it would be a testimony real quick that you just don't do that in our land. Right. But instead it gets drawn out. And what happens is, is that mankind gets bold. 
uh, the children of God, we're subject to it. We've got this old man, this new man. We can disobey our Lord in things that we know we should not disobey him in. And because we don't get chastised by the yes. Lord real sharp and real quick, we get we can have a tendency just to get more bold. Right. More bold. More bold. And that can happen to us. We need to understand that. We need to realize that. But in dealing with the Lord, he can take something that was done centuries or millennia ago, and when he comes and deals with it, it will be just like it just happened. Right. His memory is perfect. And he is able to take transgression from millennia ago and bring it up right here to now. And deal with it. We need to remember who's dealing with us. So anyway, let's take a look first at this first judgment. The judgment of the saved. And let me, let me declare this, and, and, and I trust that you know it. Maybe there's some that don't. But in regards to the judgment of the saved, there is no eternal damnation. Okay? There's no eternal damnation. Christ having died for us, shed his blood, suffered, died, was buried, and rose from the dead. He paid for our sins from the standpoint of eternity. Amen. We've been rescued. We've been made secure. I mean, we are secure in Christ from the standpoint of being separated from God. That's done. Whether it be sins that are past, as the Bible speaks about, I think that past is talking about to the point of salvation, or they even be the sins that we commit as the Lord's children to the day that he comes for us or we die and he takes us on to be with him. From the standpoint of eternity and that, that damnation, that condemnation, Christ has taken care of that for us. But, but we do have the rest of the life that we live. And uh, we have accountability Amen. as the Lord's children. Romans 14, 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now this is written to the church of Rome. What's the context? We're the church made up of saved folks and uh, church members. And so that's the context. That's who's being spoken up to and to us and that it carries through to we who are members of the Lord's churches here. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's a subject for another time. And he says, why dost thou judge thy brother? There's two aspects to judgment, and it's hard to delineate. It's hard to not touch one both when you're dealing with the subject. But there's that of what's the law and what's been done. And then if it's uh, crossways with the law or against the law, then there's punishment. Okay, that's judgment. Okay. Well, you and I, we're supposed to take what the Lord says and abide by that. And when you look on at me and you see me disobeying what the Lord says ought to be, well, it's not that you're not supposed to say, well, Brother Jim's just not obeying the Lord. He's just not doing what the Lord says right here in the scripture. We, we are to look on and to have the opinion of the Lord about things. Amen. But it's not your job to come and punish me. Punishment is reserved for the Lord. The closest thing that we get to it is in church discipline. Okay, that's the closest place that we get to that, and that is under the leadership and the direction of the Lord. But otherwise, we make calls about things based on not what we think, but what the Lord says. Right. But then after that, after that, aside from that, that thing of, of what the Lord's given us in his church, after that, <laughs> the rest of that belongs to him. And so that's what the, this is speaking. Why dost thou judge uh, thy brother and, and you're, you're persecuting him because of this difference? Or why dost thou set it not? Take him and just ignore him, setting him aside. Fellow child of God. Nope, got to look that way. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And whatever the case is, it's going to be known. That it's, the, the, the facts are never going to be lost with the Lord. And so, Lord, help us to remember that and to be helped by that, that we might be like Jesus in regards to our part 
and the aspects of his attributes that were to follow, and those attributes of God's that were not to follow, like judgment, vengeance, mm -hmm. punishment, <laughs> and the demons aside. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Again, church context, and then with the church, you've got people that are saved, right, to us, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So there we are as the children of the Lord. I've done some obedient things. And I've done some disobedient things. And the Lord's going to judge me in regards to what I've done. Mm -hmm. We get more clarity if we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll pick it up in verse number 9. Again, speaking about the judgment of the Lord's children, the judgment of the saved, the judgment of the redeemed, not eternal damnation, that would be the punishment. No, not that. We've been saved from that, but we do have a responsibility. Two passages that we want to take in and compare together and or bring them together that we might have understanding about what we as the children of the Lord face. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 through 15. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Okay, church. We understand that about a building with the church, right? When it, not the church building. We are built on the foundation of the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And we're built up as his house, his churches. New Testament Baptist Church, the New Baptist Church, Faith Baptist Church. You are Austin Baptist Church. We are houses mm -hmm. of the Lord, not the building, but the people. Amen. We're, we're where he goes and tills and stirs and works in us, right? According to the grace of God, verse 10, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, Paul is talking about his calling right now. I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon. It's the same kind of thing as uh, one planted, one watered, another gave the increase. Yeah, the same kind of thing, okay? But let every man... And this is where he departs from his own case to get to all of us. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. The foundation that we have, take heed. Pay attention to how you build. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So there's our foundation, our Lord. Now if any man build upon this foundation, Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. So the foundation is Christ. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what the Lord Jesus say? If we don't have the foundation of the solid rock of Christ, we're building on the sand. Mm -hmm. Okay? That whole structure is just not going to last. But as we build, we build the foundation of our home, or build upon Christ and the foundation of the, in our homes, that's one building, or in our lives, or in our churches, we need to watch how we build. Amen. So here in our own life, how are we building? Well, we've got, a, we've got building material here. Gold, silver, precious stones, and we've got wood, hay, and stubble. Listen, verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. What we do is going to be shown forth one day, for the day shall declare it. What day? The day of judgment for us, because it shall be revealed by fire. Wait a minute, Brother Jim. Uh, you said, we know the Bible's clear, we're not going to hell. That's right, we're not going to hell, but it's going to be revealed by fire. Mm -hmm. The source, I believe, of that fire is interesting. And, it, and I think it'll help us understand the, the, the great import and importance of this. Because it shall be revealed by fire. How we have built on the foundation of Christ will be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. <laughs> if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Yeah. So when this fire, whatever the source of this fire is, when it comes upon the work of a child of God's life, if it remains, there'll be a reward. What else does it say? If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer a loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Amen. We've got some examples in the scriptures about those that were saved. 
But they really didn't build much on the foundation. Did right. They? No, they, they didn't. But the trying fire here that reveals our words. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 10. It's a parallel passage, I'm persuaded. And let's bring it into this, into this thought for the judgment of the saved. One day, the day shall declare it, Hebrews 10. And uh, let, let's pick it up in verse uh, uh, verse number uh, 21, okay? He's speaking about Jesus being high priest again, uh, having boldness to enter in by the blood of Christ, verse number 19. Verse 22, we got instruction here. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Amen. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now understand, I believe this book of Hebrews is not generally just given to Jews as a whole, but I believe that what we hear and what we see in this book, especially in this passage, is written to saved. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's written to saved. That's the context. So he says, let's draw near. Am I drawing near? Okay. Are you drawing near? Verse number 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith, our faith in Christ, without wavering. For he's faithful to promise. The Lord's bad with us. He's never going to waver. We need to hold the profession of our faith in him without wavering. Second thing for us to follow. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and the good works. That's that fellowship unto a, a thing profitable before our, before our Lord. An encouragement. That's, that's the reason for the institution of the church. The Lord's church is, and, and, uh, is, is been made by the Lord because he knows that we need that, that connection with others. We need that fellowship for his sake together to, to lift up those that are fallen. All of us have times that we're down. We need to lift it up. We all together look to praise and honor and glorify the Lord. We look to fulfill the great commission Amen. that he us to fulfill. Okay. And then number four, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I, well, you got a church man right here, don't you? Indeed we do. We've got a man here that's thinking and, and looking about the church. Don't forsake the assembling. Amen. He's not talking about at the synagogue, <clears throat> nor at the temple. He's talking about in the Lord's church. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. <coughs> but exhorting one another, hey, be in service. Mm -hmm. yeah. Come to the function of the church. Mm -hmm. Come help work in the church. Uh, by example, by our words. Exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, whether that be the Lord's day, the day of meeting or the coming of our Lord. What? Pick the one you want. They all apply. Verse 26. <coughs> here's, here's how it is to you and I that are saved. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, what do you think we might be building with if that would be the case? Right. How about wood, hay, stubble? Yeah. Willful sinning. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. See, when I was saved, when the Lord saved me in 1987, all the wickedness and sin and transgression that I knew of and I didn't even know of, I was forgiven for that and will not be called on the carpet for that. I did it in ignorance. I did it willfully from the standpoint of being unsaved, but Christ forgave me. But then going forward, in ignorance I may do things, but then in knowledge I do things. In willfulness I do things. Uh, we have all these cases with us. We have this old man and new man that we're wrestling back and forth with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the old man gets the upper hand one day, the new man right, is better off one another day. We petition and pray to the Lord, we let our prayer slide. We're not in the word of God. You just don't know when you're young in the faith. Uh, you, you just maybe, there's those we know that just don't grow, just don't avail themselves to what God said. There's all kinds of different combinations. 
But you know what? As a child of God, I've got accountability going forward. Amen. I think that's what the reference is. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. <laughs> We're secure eternally. <laughs> I've got to answer for this when I disobey. And in the context of this passage, when I disobey willfully, no better do something else. But it says, if we sin, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, these four things listed up here that we're to stay after, or other things, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but instead a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Yeah. Did you, just the fiery indignation? What's indignation mean? I'm seeing that with indignation, somebody is really, really angry. Mm -hmm. Somebody is really, really angry, and they're hot with anger. If I sin willfully, that's what I can expect. Let's read on. Which shall devour the adversaries. This, this, this fiery indignation, if the adversaries were present, they would be gone. But not so for the child of God. Because when we stand before the Lord, we'll have a body like Christ. And you know what? I'm going to give this to you just a little bit earlier than I was in the message. This fire of the holiness of our Lord is going to do nothing but refine us and prepare us to be in his presence for eternity. All the wood and stubble is going to be burned up. Amen. And you know what's done for Christ. The treasure laid up in heaven. The, the obedience to his will as he's given us and given us understanding and put us, uh, we are context in his church. We've got responsibility with that as where we have obeyed, those things will remain. And then we'll be there with what we have, with his reward, whatever he chooses to do, leave it with him. But all this junk is going to be burned up. And <coughs> But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Here's some references. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witness. witnesses. Disobeyed the law, you died. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how serious obeying the Lord is. Mm -hmm. Okay, in that day, we're glad that that's not the case right. now, aren't we? Amen. Yeah. Of how much sore punishment. He said, he said that was light compared to children of God willfully sinning against the Lord, of how much sore punishment suppose ye that he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and done despite to the Spirit of grace. Surely that's talking about somebody unsaved. Amen. But it's not. Amen. It's speaking to children. Amen. Because when I sin willfully, that's what I do. I stomp on what my Savior did for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I know, when I say, well, the grace of the Lord will cover me going ahead and just letting this slide this time. Mm -hmm. Stomping on Christ. Done despite to the Spirit. Uh, the the uh, account of the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. See, it's talking about somebody that's set apart. Right. By the Lord, somebody saved. An unholy thing. It's done despite to the spirit of grace. The spirit, isn't that a wonder? We I've, I've dealt with this at, at our church about how is it that the Holy Spirit of God that is the, is, uh, is the working power of God, if you will, how is it that the Spirit of God sets himself up to be willing <laughs> to be quenched? <laughs> Quench not the Spirit. Right. How is it that the Holy Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the waters and of the deep allows himself to be grieved? <laughs> I tell you what, our love, uh, the love for our Lord and the, the love of our Lord for us and the patience of our Lord with us and the long suffering of our Lord with us, we need to sit down, I need to sit, sit down and meditate and think about that for a while. Amen. More than I do, because right. he sure is. Amen. 
That, that, that's, that's just something. So he says, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite of the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, if you will allow me, everything, saith the Lord. And again, this is just another point of clarity about who's being spoken to. The Lord shall judge his people. He's going to judge us. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God for the child of God. Oh yeah, for the, for the unrepentant and unbelieving, surely it is. But it even is for you and me. When we stand before him in that day, we'll stand there because of Christ and we'll see who it is that we stand before. And we'll stand there alone. We feel better about things if we do it in gangs and groups. But when the judgment, when our judgment comes, we're going to be standing there alone. There you go. Again, I want to try to relay the import of that to all of us. Every person in the house, alone. Now, standing there before Christ as somebody that's saved, we do stand there with him, too. He stands with us. But it'll just be, won't be me and Clarissa. It'll be me. It'll be you. He goes on here and he, and he looks to, after laying that out and telling them, he says, but call to remembrance the former days. Amen. Think about when salvation was fresh. Think about the joy that you had, the zeal that you had. Go back to there. Yeah. Go back to the, that obedience, that, that hunger, that thirst for the Word of God, that, yeah. that babe that desired the sincere milk of the Word. Go back to that attitude and that pursuit, which after you were, in which after you were illuminated. It, it, again, it makes it clear it's to the saved, isn't it? <laughs> Not to the unsaved, it's to the saved. We will be judged by the refining fire of our Lord's holiness. <laughs> With Moses, the Lord kind of choked down his glory so it wouldn't, it wouldn't obliterate Moses. Moses said, I want to see you. So, well, you can only see the backside of me. And then that made him radiate for 40 days, right? Mm -hmm. I believe that's, that's right, maybe longer. A Jesus, when he came, became a man, he had to take his glory and choke it down. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, he let a little bit of it go because Peter, James, and John weren't destroyed. <laughs> All right. But in glory, he's going to let it fly, if you will. I mean that in the greatest reverence. And you know what? You and I have to be in a shape, children of God, that we can be able to be there in there. Amen. And that's all the wood, hay, stubble, all the sin, all the taint, everything gone. And that's what he's going to do for us. We will be judged by the refining fire of our Lord's holiness. We will be purified beyond that of silver refined seven times. He will do that so we can live with him in the fullness of his glory. So I want to admonish all of us, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, Brother John writes, he's an old man when he writes this, abide in him, mm -hmm. live in him, live for him, fellowship with him, follow him, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Amen. him. At his Amen. Amen. What a terrible thing to be willfully sinned <clears throat> when our Lord comes back for us. <clears throat> oh, good thing he can come back now. <clears throat> and then, what every pastor wants, uh, every, every church member that they pastor to hear is what our Lord said in Matthew 25, isn't it? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's, that's what we want for those of the pastor. That's what we want for all the children of God. And we need to want that for ourselves too. There's a second judgment, and that's the judgment of the unrepentant and unbelieving. 
And the judgment of the unrepentant and unbelieving, it, it involves eternal damnation. No, no Christ as Savior, no blood from Calvary, no, no propitiation, no substitute sacrifice. No substitute sacrifice. No intercessor, no mediator. It's a lonely place to not be saved. Mm-hmm. Brother Jim, you're scaring me. I tell you what, my, my desire is not for me to make you afraid. I tell you what, you need to be fearful of God. Amen. You need to understand about God and who he is and his righteousnesses and holiness and how bad sin is and your desperate need of him. I can't scare anyone into salvation. Where I tell you what, if the Lord will open your eyes and see who he is and how bad sin is and how wonderful the Savior is, that's, that's, what, we, that's what I desire. The judgment of the unrepentant and unbelieving. And we want to mention that Satan was judged when Christ came. That's one of the judgments. Um, and we're going to be going to uh, Revelation chapter 20 here in a moment. Satan was judged when Christ came and was cast into the lake. That's what it said. John 12, 31. Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Later on, four chapters later, in John 16, 11, he t- speaks about the work of the Spirit, the Comforter, and his churches, and that he'll reprove the world of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Satan's already been judged. Right. It's done. His judgment is done. He's just waiting for the sentence to be meted out. Okay? The fallen angels uh, in Revelation chapter 20, which we'll get to here in a moment, they've been judged too Or by, by the time we get to Revelation 20. And isn't this interesting in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3? Paul writes, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? <laughs> Writing that to a church that we might not even fellowship with. <laughs> How much more things that pertain to this life, and of course he's dealing with them with their house that was not in order, their church that was not in order. So if Satan has been judged, and the angels will be, the fallen angels will be judged, does any man think? Any man, woman, boy, or girl, unrepentant and unbelieving, think that they will escape judgment? It's fine. Mm -hmm. If if the author of sin has been judged, all Mm -hmm. will be judged. Mm -hmm. All will be judged. Jesus, as he, uh, in his ministry, he speaks of this about and he warns of eternal punishment, which comes right after judgment. Like I mentioned earlier, this is judgment is twofold. There's the determination of if the law has been crossed or not. And if that is to the affirmative, there's the punishment that goes along with it. And so they're, they're very closely connected. Jesus, he dealt with these folks in Luke 13. Uh, they... They heard about some Galileans that Pilate had killed, and seemingly they were sacrificing, and and it it says there in the scripture in Luke 13 that he had mingled their blood with their sacrifices. So it was was an affront to them. And the superstition of the Jews uh, led them to believe, said, well, if that happened to them, they must have really, really good, really been bad. You know, it's a circumstantial kind of thing. If, If it was more tragic the way somebody died, uh, more unjust the way somebody dies, and something must have been wrong with them. They must have really been bad people. But Jesus said it to them. He says, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Is he talking that Pilate is going to come and kill them like that? No, he's talking about something worse. Mm-hmm. Judgment by God and eternal damnation forever. Forever. He speaks about those upon uh, whom a tower there in that in Jerusalem, it seems, or in the suburbs of Jerusalem, and a tower fell on 18 people and killed them. And, and Jesus asked, do you think that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? Do you think that that happened to them because they're just really, really bad? I tell you, no. No. But except you repent. 
See, the repentance changes the judgment because receiving the salvation of Christ involves repentance. And we know that, you know, we speak about our repentance is faith and our unseparable graces. If there's repentance, there's faith. If there's faith, there's repentance. And, and that's, that's where what judgment a person will be at all hangs on is where they stand with Christ. Repentance and faith, or rejection and denial and blasphemy. And so Jesus speaks about this. He speaks to the man in John chapter 5. He says uh, he heals him, and the man doesn't know. I think he's the man at the pool of Bethesda. He finds him in the temple. The man's been healed. It's, it's a marvel. He said, you've been made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing will come to you. And so Jesus spoke about that judgment that lies ahead for those without Christ. As we referred earlier, what John the Baptist preached, it's also parallel to Luke 3. Remember what he said about the wheat? He's going to take it, put it in the, put it in the threshing floor, and he's going to break up the kernel from the chaff. And what's going to happen to the chaff? A fire that can't be put out. Unquenchable. You can't you cannot put enough water on it to make it go out. Mm -hmm. The Lord also deals with how bad sin is in Mark chapter 9. He does this three times over. He said, if, if cutting off your hand will, will keep you out of uh, condemnation before the Lord, keep you away from sin, cut off your hand. Is the Lord saying cut off your hand? And he's making the point how bad sin is. Amen. If, 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 it would be better for you to go into life without one foot if that would do the trick to keep you away from sinning against God Almighty or plucking out your eye. It'd be better to go having just one eye into glory if that would do the trick for you to stay away from sin and wickedness. But we know that those things won't work. Right. What's a sinful man going to do? He's going to use the other eye to sin against God. He's going to use the other foot. To get, he's going to use the other hand, right? But that's how bad sin is. And three times over, the Lord refers to this place. He says, where the worm dieth not. That means the consciousness, the memory. We're going to have perfect memory mm -hmm. for those in hell and the lake of fire. Remember it all. Yeah. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Those are the words of Jesus telling and warning about this that lies ahead right. for the unrepentant and unbelieving. Then we come to this in Revelation 20. And we hear uh, in this, we, we hear the, the, the doing of the deed, if you will. <laughs> Satan's been dealt with, as I mentioned earlier, the false prophet cast in the lake of fire. And, and we see this in verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne. That's the reason we call it the great white throne judgment. I don't think it's any different than the judgment seat of Christ, personally. But the, what's going on here is reserved for thieves. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them, no place for the earth, no place for the heaven. And I saw the dead, those are souls, souls of people, and it's and from the standpoint of this reference, the dead is talking about their spiritual condition. Dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. The unknowns, the small and the great, the very well known, stand before God. And the books were open, and we believe that that would be the Bible. And another book was open. And I, there's also the references to the scripture that says that the Lord's got a lot of books of remembrance. Mm -hmm. Everything. He knows it all. How can that be? He knows it all. Mm -hmm. Which is the book of life. So the books and the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works, what they did, what they did, <coughs> what they have done, whether it be 6,000 years ago or whether it was just 
when the Lord Jesus came and destroyed the armies when he landed on the Mount of Olives. Or, um, or even the timing of that with the millennial reign. Mm -hmm. It's all going to be known. It's all going to be brought forth. Not one element for God. Because, see, that's all these people have. These people that are here at this judgment, there's no say at this judgment. There's no children of God at this judgment from the standpoint of being the subject of the judgment. These are all those that are unrepentant and unbelieving. Mm -hmm. What have they got? What they've done. Mm -hmm. It's all they've got. And the books of God are going to be brought out, and they're going to be judged individually, I believe, by what's mm -hmm. written written in the books. Uh, it's a serious, sobering thing. Yeah. It is of most, the most eternal, of most eternal importance to you yeah. here tonight. That's right. He goes on to say here, and the sea gave up the dead which, which were in, in it. Right? The sea can't hide them. And death and hell, the grave, delivered up the dead which were in them. Mm -hmm. In John chapter 5, the Lord Jesus says, there's coming a time that I want to call everybody. I want to call my children. And that you know what? They're going to come. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is worth making us come. And then I'm going to call the damned. And they're going to come too. No matter where they're at. Burned up, destroyed, ate up in the sea. Not to be morbid, but they're all going to come up. Of the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man, man according to their works. And death and hell... Death because of sin and the grave were cast in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. There was Satan and the false prophet and the angels, fallen angels. This is the second death. Mm -hmm. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Which, that's the Lord's business. That's his business about the book of life. I've never seen it. <clears throat> But how do we know our name's written there? Hmm. Because the Lord's children believe. Amen. The Lord's children receive it. Also in this is in the next chapter, verses 6 through 8 in chapter 21. And John writes, And he said unto me, It is done. Jesus speaking, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. That's for the children of God. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Amen. Say amen to that. Don't we? What a day that will be. But the fearful, and the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, understand, from all of these things, the Lord's children have been saved. Mm -hmm. I was a liar. As a child, I was a thief. But I've been saved from that. I don't continue <laughs> on in that. But these are those that continue on in that. Mm -hmm. Why? They've not been changed. They've not been, they've not been rescued. They've not received. They've not repented of their sins and their transgression and their way before God. All of these that continue on and love their sin more than the Lord shall have their part of the lake, of the lake which brings the fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Mm -hmm. And then there's this that I want to bring in to the parallel of this. Familiar passage, John 3, 16, verses, uh, John 3, verses 16 through 21. Listen to what the scripture says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how to not die mm -hmm. twice. It's by Christ. Mm -hmm. But to live forever. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. That was the first time. He came to save for the first time. When he comes back, he'll be judging. Amen. God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believed upon him is not condemned. We believe and trust in Christ. We come to him in repentance.
repentance and faith. The second death, eternal damnation, taken away by him. Mm -hmm. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. It's hanging over like a cloud, like a death cloud over the unrepentant and unbelieving. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God to believe in him, mm -hmm. to trust and rest in him. Not what you can do, but what he has done. Mm -hmm. And to believe that he's done it for you. And this is the condemnation. This is the affront to God. That light has come into the world in his son. And men love darkness rather than light because right. things were evil. Just love to sin. Yep. And hate every way of the Lord. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light. Lest his deeds should be reproved. They'll be shown. The light shines on, on all that. and reveals that. And we praise our Lord for showing our wickedness and our sin. And showing it to us. That we might see it before him. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. That his deeds may be made manifest. That they are wrought in God. I, I, I want to. I want to deal with this uh, real quick. Why do people go to hell when they die? We know that the Lord Jesus said that about the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus went on to be with the Lord, Abraham's bosom, they're in paradise with the Lord. Uh, but the rich man, he died in, in hell, lift up his eyes. Why is, it, why is it that when people die, before this time of this great white throne judgment, they die and then and go to hell and then are brought up for the great white throne judgment. Why, why is it that they go to hell to burning and fire and brimstone? And then in some day future, you know, Cain's been there for nearly 6,000 years. And he's going to be brought up at the great white throne judgment for judgment and then cast into the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. But why, why is it that way? Well, this in John tells us why I believe. They have condemned themselves in their lifetimes by not believing the Lord and not in our day of receiving Christ. Therefore, at death, their punishment begins because their case is determined, sealed, and unchangeable. If you die without Christ as Savior, it's done. That, that the truth is at hand, unrepentant, unbelieving, there is no other case. There is no change. That's, that's the wickedness of the doctrine of purgatory, that somebody's state can be changed when they leave out of this life. No, it's done. Amen. Yeah. As, as we read in the text verse, it's appointed unto man who wants to die and have that to judge him. Therefore, at death, their punishment begins because their case is determined, sealed, and unchangeable. They died in trespasses and sins. And so if you're here and you're not saved, don't die in trespasses and sins. Look to the Lamb of God. Then the Lord's design for the unrepentant and unbelieving is one mass judgment at his great white throne for all to see, for all to bow, for all to be silent, for all to be judged individually, I believe, for all to be witness to one another's judgment, and for the truth across all centuries to be established. The Lord's not going to let a lie ever pass. But truth will reign for eternity. And everything done on this earth is going to be set out straight. You know, all the mysteries about JFK and what really happened there. <laughs> right? All the, all the false flag attacks of different nations that have started so many wars. All that stuff's going to be settled. Uh, all the power brokers in the world over the centuries and people of wealth and influence and the, the meddling they did with people and nations, it's all going to be set straight. There's not going to be a question mark on anything in eternity. We're going in. The Lord is going to set it straight because truth is big in his lips. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's his design. The white throne, great white throne judgment will be a mass judgment of the unrepentant and unbelieving. Then as a result of their judgment, they will die the second death forever. Born once, die twice. Right. When we hear say, 
we've been born again. And we'll only physically die once. And then, as if we didn't know, but it's very clear, the Lord says, the scripture says that Jesus is that judge. He is the Lord Jesus. He's the Savior and he's the judge. He's the one uh, that John the Baptist preached about and, and warning those of his day. Who's warned you to flee the wrath to come? He said, uh, remember this one that's coming after me. He's going to gather his wheat into the garner and he's going to burn the chaff. He's going to gather the wheat into the garner out of the threshing floor and he's going to burn the chaff with Fire, fire unquenchable. Jesus is the judge. Mm -hmm. He says so. He says as much in John chapter 5, verse 22. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Mm -hmm. That means he's going to make a determination against the law, and he's going to mete out the punishment. Jesus will do it all. As of the Brother Luke writes in Acts 17 31, because he, God, hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. See, men won't stand before a spirit or an aura or a misty vapor. <laughs> All men, women, boys, and girls are going to stand before the God-man mm -hmm. on his throne yeah. Are you ready for that? I'll tell you what, we can't do anything about the past, but Lord help us that we do well with the future. Yeah. Yeah. His children. Mm -hmm. For you that are here and not saved, we point to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't meddle with God. You have no standing in his court to utter a word. Repent. And believe and trust in his son. Oh, what a blessing to be saved. Amen. That's right. Oh, what a blessing to be saved. As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. I'm thankful he bore my sins. Mm -hmm. Not because I'm anything, but because it pleased him to do so. I praise his name for it. Mm -hmm. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin and the salvation. He won't be coming to deal with sin from the standpoint of paying for it. He'll be coming to get us, finish our salvation, and that we'll have a body like his, and then he'll judge us. Our, our state, our rewards will be determined in that, as we've seen in the scriptures, will be refined. We'll be able to be in the presence of the Lord when his full glory shines forth and be there and bask in that and rejoice in that. I tell you what, I pray the message tonight for we that are saved brings a little bit more weight to Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Again, if you're here and you're not saved, you need Christ. We even trust in Him. We either say, "May Lord, may we live for our Lord." Amen. And do well for Him. Amen. 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 Amen.